two years ago, uh, I, I was here presenting, well, I was in the first edition of this event presenting the uh, vision that we had of such an operator. And uh, I'm pretty excited today to actually talk about what is it that we built in the past two years and that we, and uh, yeah. So I'm Mehdi, I'm an engineering manager uh, in the data platform team uh, at Canonical and I will be joined uh, by Michel, who is a product manager in the data platform team at Canonical. Uh, so the agenda for today's presentation would be uh, Describing a bit what is it that we do in the data platform team at Canonical, uh, introducing the charmed open source operator that we built, the architecture of the operator, how to deploy it, and the various deployment modes of this operator, how to observe an open source deployment through uh, deployed with this operator, then a case study and a demo. Uh, then Michel will join me on stage to describe the list and the, uh, list the features that we have for this operator as well as announcements and closing. Um, so the data platform team at Canonical is a, essentially a group of engineers uh, working on uh, developing cloud agnostic automations of open source uh, data systems. So databases, be it open source, MongoDB, uh, MySQL, Postgres, and so on and so forth and according to the data systems best practices, right? So what we do is effectively implement the best practices of operations of these data systems into code that is reusable and that is bundled. Uh, so we produce three types of artifacts. The first one is uh, the operators, which is what I just described, essentially uh, best practices programmed for operating uh, a complex data system. SNAPS, which is a self-contained uh, package that is installable on Linux, and ROCKS, which are essentially OCI uh, images. Uh, so the charmed open source operator runs uh, with Juju, uh, right? So it is cloud agnostic. The current version of the Charm operator is VM and uh, machines uh, specific, meaning that it runs on any type of environment given that this uh, substrate provides with bare metal or uh, VM instances. So whether be it on premise or on AWS, Azure, OpenStack, it doesn't really matter, right? So uh, given such a deployment, for example, in a bare metal and VM, so the model is to create uh, is effectively a, a logical space grouping similar uh, resources, right? So a model in bare metal that serves bare metal instances, another one uh, that serves VMs on whatever uh, substrate is it we're interested in. And then uh, within the model, we deploy resources, right? And resources are effectively compute units. And uh, they can be instances in the case of AWS or Azure, they can be machines and so on and so forth. Within those instances or units, uh, we install what we call a Juju agent, and this is effectively the piece of software that intercepts events coming from the CLI, coming from, and also emitting the lifecycle of an application, right? An application being open source in this case. The charm code is bundled within this unit, and this is uh, what intercepts the events emitted by the Juju agent and interacts with the systemd service of uh, open source that is exposed. Uh, thanks to the open source snap. Uh, next, so given the deployment of such an operator, so a user types in juju deploy open source uh, three units minus n3, meaning I would like a cluster of three units of open source. Uh, this is intercepted through uh, by the juju controller, which effectively then broadcasts the event to the model. And in this case, it will follow a specific flow. The first one is spinning up an instance on the cloud substrate, whatever that is, right? AWS or OpenStack or whatever. So spin up an instance, a unit as defined by the model specification, then install the Juju unit agent within this instance, start the charms lifecycle. And the charms lifecycle is a set of steps that every single unit operated through this operator is obliged to follow. For example, we start a unit starts with the install uh, event, right? The install event is effectively what will 
install the open source snap, then followed by the start uh, event and hook, which is effectively what starts the systemd service, does a bunch of checks, sanity checks, and so on and so forth, right? So the charmed operator's code effectively uh, implements these hooks, the hooks that are emitted by the whole, uh, by the Juju uh, agent. We program them in Python and we say, we define what it is that we want to uh, implement. Uh, right, so other examples of uh, operations that we can run with Juju and given the uh, open source charm. So to deploy uh, a cluster of three units, as I showed, Juju deploy three units of open search. Say you wanna scale up, Juju add units, the number of units you're interested in. Wanna scale down, horizontally scale down, removing a unit or altering the config of a deployment, setting the roles data hot to all uh, units in, in a model, right? So you can do that through Juju config. And one of the coolest features is about Juju integrations, meaning effectively integrating the open search deployment with other client applications or other applications providing certain types of values, for example, observability, right? Similarly, for rolling upgrades, it's as simple as Juju uh, refresh, open search revision latest. So you, you sort of get the idea of how it is that we interact with an open source cluster operated by Juju, right? And this effectively simplifies sort of the management of such a fleet. And it's really up to the user how they want to type in these types of command, whether through a UI, whether through a command line, whether their own uh, automation. But as you see, this is more focused on the day plus two operations, meaning post deployments. We do deploy, but you can choose how to deploy this operator either manually, through Terraform, through Ansible, it doesn't really matter. But the day two, uh, day plus two operation is where the whole operator's logic is very much uh, important. So the architecture of the charmed open source operator, so there is a hard, so in red is effectively the mandatory components of a deployment of uh, the open source, charmed open source uh, operator deployment. And as you see, TLS is a central point of uh, such a deployment. So the TLS, we ha those are as well operators. All of these blocks are operators. The red arrow uh, indicates the mandatory integration for an open source deployment to, be, uh, to succeed. All the green arrows are effectively optional charms to deploy in case we want to enrich and expand further on uh, this operator, on this deployment, right? So uh, the TLS certificates provider this is the charm and the operator that provides with certificates. And either we have two options, either uh, work with a self-signed certificates operator that provides self-signed certificates, or with a manual TLS operator, given that the user is the one uh, inputting and setting a CA chain, a root CA chain, and so on and so forth, right? So uh, then this is integrated with the open source cluster, which is an application, a Juju application, right? And then, it's, I mean, the whole integration is uh, limitless depending on the type of use case. So assuming that you would like to have backups in S3, right? We have an operator for this, the S3 integrator, and it's as easy as deploy S3 integrator, which gives us S3 credentials, right? Access key and secret key to backup your data in S3. Assume you wanted to have a client credential specific to a certain index uh, for an application running outside of Juju. You deploy the data integrator. Uh, the open source dashboards is also exposed as a, an operator. So it's as easy as Juju deploy open source dashboards. And as you see, the whole thing is run through Juju integration as this is the central piece of this design is that we have uh, separate pieces that can glue, be glued together through Juju uh, integrations. Uh, right. So how to deploy uh, this thing? How to have, how to deploy an open source cluster uh, with high availability, of course, self-healing and so on and so forth. So this is the whole value proposition of this operator. So we have two modes of deployment. So simple deployments and large deployments. For simple deployments, one open source Juju application equals one open source cluster, right? So 
we add a model, dev, we deploy the self-signed certificates, as we said. We deploy four units of this, uh, the open source operator. And then we integrate the open source operator with the self-signed certificate. So as soon as we have this, this effectively translates in compute terms into a model that's called dev, which is a logical grouping of these resources, an application that is TLS provider, right, with a unit slash zero and four units of open source. And now with this, we effectively have a cluster that's up and running. So on more complex deployments, where you would like to have more of a diverse uh, topology in your uh, application and cluster, where you would like to have, for example, dedicated nodes per roles or different constraints set up. For example, I would like my machine learning nodes to have this very specific instance type with GPU or the cluster manager dedicated node. I would like to give them cheap compute, so T2 small instances, right? We can do that. And the design that we have is to uh, shift from managing units to managing blocks of unit entities, homogeneous entities. So if I would like to deploy uh, a set of, coordinate, uh, of coordinating nodes, I can deploy them as uh, applications and then scale that application regardless of the other applications that are about cluster manager, data, machine learning, and so on. And this sort of simplifies the whole governance model of such a cluster. So team A can chime in or team B can chime in in an existing development and only maintain a particular piece of deployment and compute, right? So how is the whole UX for such a, a large deployment? Uh, so Juju deploy, we deploy a first application, which we call main. I'm sorry about the font. Uh, so we deploy uh, an open source application that we name main. We give it the roles cluster manager. Then say we want to deploy another one that we call failover and should have all the roles, including cluster manager, data, and so on and so forth. We do that with a config option that's called init hold true. We set it to true, meaning that please do not start the cluster until it is being integrated with the original one, which is the main uh, application. Then we want to scale this deployment uh, up and have a data hot specific uh, application that joins also the same deployment where we give it the roles data hot or other constraints such as the instance type and so on and so forth. Then we integrate these applications together. We integrate the main application with the failover. We integrate the main with data hot, failover with data hot and so on. And we do the same for the self-signed certificates operator, right? So now this is the scheme uh, that we find ourselves with. A model having the TLS provider which issues certificates to every single application in the said model and every single application with its own specificities and its own properties uh, all deployed and related to each other and all of it form forming a single massive open source cluster, right? So the goal of this is to form a single open source cluster constituted of diverse applications that are managed separately. Uh, how do we observe this thing, right? So it's cool. We know how to deploy. But how do we observe this? Again, Juju integrations, right? So we add a model that runs on Kates, and we deploy uh, an application called Coslight, which is a bundle, a group of observability-related applications that we deploy at once in a specific Kates model. And then we offer the applications that are deployed for consumption, meaning that I deploy the observability stack in a model, and now I would like to allow other applications outside of this model to consume and integrate with. So this is what I do with Juju offer Grafana, Grafana dashboard, Loki, Prometheus, and so on and so forth. This effectively gives us three applications. There are more, but the main focus is the three. Uh, one for Grafana, Loki, Prometheus, and so on. And those are ready to be consumed by our own open source deployment. You will notice that those are two different models. You probably don't want to mix observability resources with uh, your compute and so on. Now, on the open source side, uh, how do we observe it? So what we do is we switch back to our uh, VM model, which is where our charm was deployed. Right? And we consume these offers that we just made in the other model. Right? So we uh, exposed and we offered Grafana, Grafana dashboard, and so on and so forth. And you will see that's exactly what we do. Juju consume, 
cos, Grafana, cos, Loki, and so on. Then we deploy a Grafana agent charm, which is a subordinate uh, charm, and you can think of it as a sidecar uh, component to our open source deployment. And we integrate with the offers that uh, we talked about. This effectively gives us the little square on the bottom where we have our open source unit instances. And now with a Grafana agent added to it and also integrated with the previous uh, model. So effectively shipping uh, metrics and so on and so forth and uh, visualizable on a Grafana dashboard. Uh, now I'd like to have a small case study to show a bit how the whole scale of this operator goes and how, I mean, the whole value proposition, as I said, is that diversity in, topo in the topology of the deployment and also the cloud agnostic nature of such uh, an operator. So assume that team A built this nice little use case with very small compute, right, using open search, didn't expect any scale, didn't expect any growth, just a nice little use case, right? Uh, and they deploy their use case, their application in AWS, in, a v in their own VPC in region EU West 1, right? They have a town hall presentation, they show the, the company wh what it is that they built. Then it starts interesting other, other teams. So team two reaches out to them and tells them, hey, we are interested in your little use case. How about we give you some of our compute? We know that compute costs money. Let us help you. Let us make this thing even more robust than it already is, right? We are interested. We would like to join the initiative. Our stuff runs in another VPC in EU West 2, right? Then Team 3 comes after this whole initiative. There is more compute. It's advertised company-wide. And they say, hey, we have an ML use case, except we have our own infrastructure, our whole setup, our whole deployments, and so on, on Azure, on a virtual network. Can we still join? And the answer is obviously yes. So uh, this is what I would like to present in, uh, in this demo. So uh, team one creates a new model in a VPC EU West 1, right? So this is day zero. So you will see that they set the, uh, they add the model called orchestration one in the region EU West one with the VPC ID as set. Then they switch to the new model and this is effectively to keep track of the resources deployed uh, in this model. So we see that we have created the orchestration one uh, model and now we're going to watch the progress and the evolution of this model, the resources, their statuses, and, uh, and so on. So currently it is empty, but now we're about to deploy OpenSearch. So we will first create, uh, deploy the TLS provider charm, and the TLS provider charm is the one issuing certificates for the REST and the transport layer, as well as the admin uh, user of the operator. Uh, we don't expect much from it besides that, so we give it a small T2 small uh, instance. Now we create and deploy the main application, the main open source application. We set the roles to be cluster manager and data, uh, small instances. As I said, team one didn't expect this to scale, right? They just wanted to have a nice little demo, kickstart a new use case, and so on. So they deploy it. Uh, but they still want to have a coordinating uh, application, a coordinating node to join this. Given that there is variation in the roles of the config, so config roles coordinating, it does make sense. Uh, and on the instance type, it does make sense to create a new application for this, right? And as you see, we set up the zones. We want to have uh, this deployed in an, the three availability zone of EU West 1. All right. So, uh, now, in order for open source to start at once, at all, uh, the integration to the TLS certificates provider is mandatory, and this is exactly what we'll be doing. So we're integrating the self-signed certificates operator, and it can be as well the manual TLS operator, with the main application and with the coordinating application. And what will this do is issuing uh, certificates for the REST layer as well as the transport layer and the admin user. Uh, 
right? So now we wait a bit until the model stabilizes. The uh, open search is installed on every unit. And as a reminder, the backend cloud of this demo is AWS currently on the region EU West 1, so EC2. The installation of open search happens through the snap that is bundled and that is installed uh, from within the operator. So immediately we move to the state of waiting for TLS to be fully configured, so receiving certificates, configuring the units, and effectively starting automatically the uh, open source charm. So every operation that this charm does is effectively happening on a roll-in fashion. So every node starts in a roll-in uh, fashion, one node at a time. And we should now have effectively a three nodes cluster that's up and running. Let's verify this, right? So uh, we run an action on a unit, and this is also one of uh, Juju's features, that's called get password. This will effectively fetch the admin credentials used internally by the charm, right? Why do we do this? We wanna use the cat nodes uh, API and uh, actually see what open search is uh, reporting. So, right, uh, we see from the status that the cluster is up and running, but let's see what open source actually says. So this is what we're doing, and we see that we have three nodes. We curve the cat nodes API, and we see that we have three nodes uh, effectively deployed. So we have an open source cluster of three nodes matching the Juju deployments, right? Uh, now, what about the coordinating only node, right? So it wasn't there, we don't see it, and why? Because the coordinating node needs to be integrated with the main application, which is uh, called main. So this is exactly what we do. Juju integrate main with the coordinating application. And we see the node starting, right? So effectively joining the fleet. And this is the part where team two comes to us and says, hey, how about we add compute in VPC2 in EUS2, right? Then team A says, sure, let me offer my clusters to you. Let me offer the main application and let me offer the self-signed certificates operator, the TLS provider. So I will allow you to integrate with these. So I'm first offering them so that resources outside of my current model can consume them, right? Uh, so this is what we currently do. And then what we do is we create a user. Uh, we will create a user to be assumed by the team two, that we will call team two EWS VC2. And this effectively generates a token and a comment that team two will use to, be, uh, to see the actual Juju controller, to, to register the Juju controller used by team A. And we will grant them access to the new model, uh, allow them to create uh, a new model in, uh, managed by the same controller. And this is what we're currently doing. Right, and now we allow Team2 to integrate with these two applications, main and uh, self-signed certificates. Now we should have everything we need. Team2 can get started and reinforce our own deployment in their own uh, AWS uh, EU S2 uh, models, so we check. Let's see if we already see a controllers. Again, this is a virgin deployment. There is nothing, right? Team two just is getting started, just wants, just, is just excited to join us, right? So what we're doing, we will be registering the Juju controller that we uh, saw by giving access to team two. Now we should be able to see the controller that we had, which is AWS controller managed by uh, team one. So we see the users, effectively we see that we assume the user that was created by team one. Uh, and now we do our thing, we do our own deployment. Now we are managing our own infrastructure that is completely isolated from the previous infrastructure in another VPC, right? Which is the VPC ID that we passed here on another region, EU West 2. As a reminder, the first region was EU West 1. So the model is empty. Now we will consume the offers that were made by team one and we should be able to see them now, right? 
And we will see that we have indeed the Orchestration 1 main application and the self-signed certificate. So we consume them. And now we are able to integrate with them. So we will deploy another open source application that we call Failover. Right? Uh, we will give its nodes the roles cluster manager, small instance types, and you will see a little config option in it hold true, meaning please do not start this application until it is integrated with the main application. Then we, we deploy another coordinating uh, application so that we have our uh, final deployment has two coordinating uh, nodes. We deploy uh, another application of three nodes uh, with the roles data hot, with other constraints, and you see a different availability zone. So the whole thing starts. Uh, open source gets installed and so on and so forth. And you will notice uh, blocked statuses on top. Cannot start waiting for peer cluster relations, meaning that the current deployment is effectively waiting to be integrated with the main uh, application to join the fleet. Remember, we have four nodes at the moment, right? So that's what we do. We integrate the applications with the self-signed certificates. We have three applications, uh, failover, data hot, and coordinating two, and that's what we do. And this is for uh, certificates uh, issuance. And then we integrate with the main orchestrator. That's Juju integrate, main, failover, integrate, main, coordinate, uh, and so on. Then we want to do things further. Since we have a failover, we also want it to be used as a real failover, meaning if the main application is gone, we want it to take over. So we do the same thing. We integrate the coordinating two and the data hot application with the failover. That's totally optional, but also totally doable, right? And then we have the whole workflow starting, and you'll see again in a rolling starting fashion, every node starting, waiting for open source to start and so on and so forth, right? And then we should see our fleet slowly being enriched by the nodes coming from this model. Here we already have failover zero, and I guess that fast forward in time, we see all the nodes have joined, right? And as a reminder, the management in model two is completely isolated from the management of model one. Model two does not have access to the physical resources of the first model. They have full governance over their stuff, but so does model one. So we are effectively protecting the cluster manager nodes managed by team A and team B, right? Then team uh, B feels uh, generous and says, I can also offer my failover for others to integrate with, right? Then comes team three. Team three runs on Azure, on a virtual network, and they would like to have uh, a machine learning use case, so a deployment exclusively constituted of machine learning nodes, right? The same user experience, we add a user, we grant the permissions to integrate uh, with the main cluster and the TLS provider, obviously. And the whole UX is basically the same. It does not matter that we are on Azure, that we are on AWS, that we are on OpenStack, the whole thing integrates, right? So we allow, we grant them access, and we give them uh, a registration token so that they see our own resources, right? But remember, the guys on Azure have their own thing going, their own infrastructure, their own controller, Azure VM controller, meaning that they have their own uh, whole deployment, and they're good, right? So they have other systems running. But we can still give them access to a completely different deployment, right? So we create a model on Azure that's called processing on Azure East US region, completely different resource group name, and on a VNet that we specify over there. Uh, so we switch, and now we should be able to monitor the actual uh, model, which is processing, running on Azure East US. All right. Same thing, we register the controller managed by team one, right? Uh, which is basically copy pasting the token that we, uh, we had in the first step, in the previous step. This is done. Now we should be able to see the offers exposed by team one, right? 
and we see them. They are managed by a different controller called EWS controller, completely isolated. We see it, we integrate with them, and then we should be able to effectively start and deploy resources to integrate with the main cluster and join the fleet. So that's what we do. We deploy a machine learning app where the roles, the open source roles, are machine learning. And similarly, in it hold true, a completely different instance type in this case, and different availability zones. All right. Similarly, the resources start being deployed and we should, we should see the whole uh, provisioning flow happening uh, where the charm takes over and starts its own lifecycle uh, installing, starting, and so on and so forth, right? So, yeah. Then again, similarly, cannot start waiting for pre-cluster relations. We consume the offers made by uh, model one and we integrate with them with the self-signed certificates operator, with the main uh, orchestrator, and then we will imminently see that this application is also starting and its node being added to the main fleet, right? So we do that, and as you see, the whole workflow of waiting for open source to start, and the three nodes effectively added at the end of, uh, of the fleet. Right, so, we have three deployments, EU West 1, EU West 2, and Azure East uh, US. Uh, and you see here the node roles uh, effectively and the backing instances on uh, EC2 and Azure VNet. And that's it. I would like to hand over uh, the next slide to uh, uh, my colleague Michel. Thank you so much, Mehdi. Thank you for talking a lot about Charmed Open Search, what it does, the architecture, the deployment part of it, and how amazing it is to actually look at diverse deployments for, for Charmed Open Search from a regular small deployment until to the large, large scale, cross model, cross region, cross cloud. I think it's it's pretty amazing. And I think that's, that's one thing that we tried to do at Canonical when we started working on this charmed open search operator. We built on top of the amazing work that the upstream has done. And we wanted to make sure that when you yourself will use open search in a production deployment, you don't need to think about these things. We have thought about the architecture, the design, and even the multi-cloud and hybrid cloud um, features and that you can see with Medi's presentation on deploying it in AWS, in Azure, and think about it being also deployed in bare metals or you know, a private cloud of your choice such as OpenStack or VMware. These are all the operational automations, and he did highlight a couple of them, but we have a lot of things that we've done in the past years, as Mehdi has mentioned, like high av availability and self-healing, the TLS, which was clearly um, shared a while ago, minor version upgrades without downtime. We also spent a lot of time to work on backup and restore with some S3-compatible storage and uh, coming soon for Azure and GCP as well. The observability was also mentioned by Mehdi. On top of that are all these alerting features that you can make use of with the Prometheus, Loki, and Grafana. Roles management, uh, role setting during and after the deployment itself. Basic user management, um, which is really very essential. Uh, basic plugin management, you can enable, disable plugins that you can use and you don't need to use. And we will support for more missing plugins that we have right now. We also develop a separate charm for the open search dashboards, which um, has some TLS implementations, etc. 
And lastly, I think one thing that enterprise is thinking when they deploy um, applications such as open search is making sure that if uh, critical vulnerability exposures is there, um, it's addressed. So at Canonical, we've developed ways to be able to, to fix those issues with a specific SLAs and support agreements. So you don't need to, to worry about you know, suddenly you just wake up and something is happening and Canonical will get your, will be helping you on that and we have automations to help you. So that's the, the charmed open search features that we've done on top of the, uh, all the amazing work that the open search upstream has done. And uh, yes, yeah, so we've shared all the features, the deployment um, works and the demos that Mehdi has shared. Now we have an important announcement. Uh, together with Mehdi, we've been working with this for a while. So we wanted to share that the Charmed Open Search is uh, generally available uh, with the Open Search version 2.17. This is the latest version of Open Search that was released last week. So you can see some documentation in, in the links that you can see in the screen, Charm Hub, and also in Snapcraft. We also have our uh, latest press release about it. We made sure that um, it's also accelerated with different hardware vendors that we were working with. One of them is Intel, uh, NVIDIA, and the rest. And at the same time, um, this is the enterprise solution at Canonical. Multi-cloud uh, support it will be given. And at the same time, all the automations that we've shared a while ago with all the features, orchestration, reliability, consistency, is, is being covered with, with this product of Canonical that we are announcing today. So we are very, very thrilled, very, very happy to share to you this news. And um, you can read more in the, the QR code for our press release. And with that, so um, what we guarantee are different types of offering, the security maintenance of your open search, as I mentioned with like, you know, CVEs, high, medium, and critical support. You have someone to call if you have any issues or questions. Managed solution means you know, with the use of the operator, someone, you can have someone from Canonical who can help you from the deployment to observability Piece, to upgrades, to backup and restore, and many more, to make sure that you know your open search is up and running. And lastly, the advisory services. Um, so it can span from you know architecture, solution design, deployments, and many more. We wanted to really make sure that you become successful in your open search journey. So that's it. That's our announcement. That's our general availability. That's the one that Canonical is offering. And um, yeah, I think we'll proceed now to... Thanks, Michelle. Good part that you wanted to promote. <laughs> yes, so if the things that we build are exciting to you, right? We are always looking for uh, strong engineers and people who believe in this mission. We write open source code, right? So uh, we are always looking for talented engineers who are interested in the stuff that we do. We have openings for the actual open source operators, but should you be interested in other databases such as MongoDB, Postgres, MySQL, and so on, please know that we are also hiring for uh, this. We have an ambitious roadmap and we would like to uh, really get help from uh, strong engineers that, are, that believe in uh, our missions. And uh, with that, I would say uh, thanks for uh, attending. And uh, if you have any questions, 